For years, certain questions have been plaguing me as a nutritionist. For example, which burns more carbs or calories, a long easy session or a short hard one? How could we even know? Beyond that, can any measure of training load actually help us figure it out? How cool would it be to take someone's TSS or other training load measure and get a good estimate of the carb and calorie use? I believe we've solved the problem of trying to measure and estimate carb and energy use during exercise, and I'm excited to share it with you. I'll show you how it works, how we got there, and how you can apply it, both in research and practice. We'll first talk about carbohydrate periodization, which is what got me interested in these questions to begin with, then how we went about measuring carbohydrate use, and then testing it and being able to apply it in practice. The ideas behind carbohydrate periodization have been around for a while now, and this paper from 2018 really did an amazing job encapsulating what it is, why we should care, and how to put it into practice. I can still remember the light bulbs going off in my head when I first saw this figure in the paper. It demonstrates how you can apply carbohydrate periodization in a practical, simple, and effective way, and I soon adopted a very similar approach in my practice. Now, it was great when I was the one making the nutrition plan, but when explaining this to the athletes so they can make their own adjustments, one problem kept popping up. Any idea what that might be? Well, how high is high and how low is low? What I imagine as a high or low carb meal might look completely different to what you might think of. For some, adding a banana might make it a high carb meal, whereas high carb to others might be a huge bowl of pasta. Same for the low meals. For some, it could still include some rice or pasta, but probably it should just be a smaller portion, whereas for others, it might be little to no carbs. There is obviously a critically important context for each athlete that needs to be understood. And if we want to do more than just guess at what high and low carb meals should look like, we'd first have to have an idea of how much we're burning so we can then have an idea about how much to increase or decrease our intake. However, historically, there have been several challenges in studying this. Carb use is estimated using indirect calorimetry, but this method is not valid during high intensity exercise due to shifting acid base balance and excess CO2 excretion. Changes in muscle glycogen are often used to estimate carb use, but this requires an invasive muscle biopsy with medical supervision and doesn't provide information on whole body carbohydrate use. Also, the level of glycogen depletion can vary with repeated sampling from the same person. Now, another approach is to calculate the contribution of the three energy systems. There's an aerobic system, anaerobic alactic system, and the anaerobic lactic system. And we calculate these during exercise based on measurements of oxygen consumption, the fast component of excess post-exercise oxygen uptake, and net changes in blood lactate concentration. This method has been used across a range of sports, as diverse as cycling, boxing, running, and rowing, and provides an estimate of kilojoules produced by each system. Seeing this study was a light bulb moment for me because it showed how you can separate out the energy contributions from each system. Here we see the VO2 response to a sample bout of exercise and recovery. We can measure the aerobic system as the shaded area, and the change in lactate gives us information about the anaerobic system. However, this approach doesn't consider the substrate, so like fat or carbohydrate, used for energy production, or differences in efficiency with each substrate. Now, people have typically used a set value of 20.9 kilojoules per liter of oxygen, but as we'll see, this is actually dependent on the fuel source being burned. So, we need to account for high RER during interval training, find a way to convert the energy yield of the aerobic system from kilojoules to calories, and consider differences in energy cost with each substrate. In combination, the traditional gas exchange measurement and the three-system approach to energy contribution could be used to estimate the total carbohydrate and energy cost of exercise at any intensity, but to our knowledge, this has yet to be reported. So let's first look at the aerobic energy system. Finding this study was key because buried deep in one of the tables was a way to calculate the energy yield from oxygen without needing a measure of carbon dioxide. Now that may not mean much to most people, but it actually becomes quite critical during high intensity exercise because there's excess CO2 being excreted. And so it can solve one of our key problems. It also allows a calculation of energy yield that varies based on the substrate. This is a small snippet of the table that lists for every RER value, the percentage of fat and carbohydrate being burned, and importantly, the energy yield for each. As we see, the energy yield can vary based on RER, and when you look at the full table, it goes between 19.6 and 21.1 kilojoules per liter of oxygen, which translates to 4.7 to 5.05 calories per liter of oxygen. So again, this approach solves both problems, excess CO2 leading to high RERs, and the differences in energy efficiency among substrates. Now, previous studies have chosen a set value of energy yield to use, but what if we could continually adjust the yield? Here's an example. 
In the first column, we see time in seconds. So it's the first 10 seconds of our session. And next, we have oxygen consumption, shown as VO2, RER, which tells us the mix of fat and carb being burned. And in the fourth column, we have the energy yield for that given RER value in calories per liter. While it doesn't vary too much in this 10 second period, over the course of a training session, they can vary by nearly 10%. For the anaerobic system, we can use the change in lactate from pre to post exercise to quantify the anaerobic contribution. That may sound like a bit of magic, but an understanding of the energy equivalence produced by the anaerobic system goes back nearly 100 years. What it works out to is that each millimolar lactate increase is equivalent to 3 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body mass. So this gives us a value of energy in kilojoules, but how do we get to grams of carbohydrate? So first, a small detour. How is it possible that we can deplete a huge amount of our glycogen during a single 30 second sprint? We could exercise for an hour at a lower intensity and still not burn as much. Well, this relates to the different efficiencies of aerobic and anaerobic energy production. Here we see a simplified view of energy production with energy output from the anaerobic and aerobic systems shown as ATP. For one molecule of glucose or glycogen, we get two to three ATP produced from the anaerobic system but we get about 34 ATP if it continues through aerobic energy production. If you're curious about the details, this is a paper you can refer back to. So thinking back to this picture, to produce 100 ATP from the anaerobic system, we need 34.5 molecules of glycogen. To produce the same amount of energy from the aerobic system, we only need 2.9 molecules. So what we can say is that anaerobic energy production is 11.8 times less efficient. This then can explain why we can burn through nearly half of our muscle glycogen in 30 seconds. The anaerobic system is expensive, but energy can be produced very quickly. I know this has been a lot to wrap your head around, so let's walk through some sample calculations. We'll take a snapshot in time where someone's VO2 is 2.9 liters per minute, their RER is 0.93, and they have a VO2 max of 3.8 liters per minute. Now the RER value of 0.93 tells us they're getting their energy uh, from about 77% carb and 23% fat. So first we calculate the energy expenditure per second. So we checked our table and RER of 0.93 yields 4.961 calories per liter of oxygen per minute. And so we know the VO2 is 2.9, so we multiply that to get 14.4 calories per minute. And I'm interested in per second, so we can do this second by second through the whole session. So we simply divide by 60 and get 0.24 calories per second. Then we get the energy from carbohydrate. So remember, it was 77% from carbohydrate. So if we take 0.24 calories per second times 77%, that gives us 0.185 calories per second that are coming from carbohydrate sources. Now, to convert from energy in calories to mass, as in grams of carbohydrate, we need to consider exercise intensity. This is because the energy yield from carbohydrate varies depending on the source, ranging from 3.7 calories per gram of glucose to 4.187 calories per gram of glycogen. The commonly used equations of Eukendrup and Wallace vary based on exercise intensity, assuming 50% of the carbohydrate oxidation is derived from glucose and 50% from glycogen during low intensity exercise. So that'd be around 50% VO2 max. Now at moderate to high intensity exercise, it's about 20% from glucose and 80% from glycogen. It's also been recommended that resting analyses should assume 100% glucose oxidation. So with this in mind, we used a scaled approach where the percent contribution from glycogen was assumed to be equal to the exercise intensity as a percentage of VO2 max. This allows a second by second adjustment according to exercise intensity. So that takes us to step three, getting the percentage from glycogen and glucose. We divide the current VO2 or 2.9 liters by the VO2 max of 3.8 liters to get 76%, leaving the balance as glucose. When we know the percentage from glycogen and glucose, we can then calculate the adjusted energy yield per gram of carbohydrate. So we have 23.7% from glucose, and we know the yield is 3.719, so that gets us to 0.881 calories per gram from glucose. We do the same for glycogen, sum them up, and it works out to 4.076 calories per gram of carbohydrate. And then we want to convert that to grams per second. So we take the 0 0.185 calories from carbohydrate from step two, divide it by the yield, and that gets us 0.045 grams of carbohydrate per second. Finally, we sum the second by second values to get the total contribution from aerobic metabolism for the entire exercise session. Okay, almost there. Now onto the anaerobic portion. We first take the delta lactate, so 
the post minus pre-exercise values and convert to kilojoules. So if we end the workout at 9.3 millimolars of lactate and we started at 1.5, that means there's a difference of 7.8. We multiply three times that delta, so three times 7.8 times body mass, and that gives us 1,638 milliliters of oxygen. And we know that it's 21.1 kilojoules per liter of oxygen. So that gets us to 34.56 kilojoules produced via the anaerobic energy production. Now remember that's work. We want to convert kilojoules to calories. So we do that by dividing by 4.184 to go from kilojoules to calories. Then we divide by 4.187 calories per grams of carbohydrate. And then importantly, we multiply by our inefficiency factor to get the carbs needed to create that given amount of energy we've used. So that gets us to 23.4 grams of carbohydrate from anaerobic metabolism. And again, that's for the entire workout. You might be thinking to yourself, this seems a bit confusing, but maybe it makes sense. Can we stress test it on some real data? Yes, I'll show you two examples of how we did that. The first way is by taking data from this very well-known paper where they measured cyclists riding for 30 minutes at 85% VO2 max using metabolic tracers and indirect calorimetry. You may recognize this figure, which has made its way into countless physiology textbooks. So I first extracted the data from the study and then calculated the energy expenditure for the session by adding up the reported values. I then calculated the estimated carb and calorie use using the new approach I've just described, and we can compare it to the estimates from what the paper has produced. And sure enough, they came out really close. The additive calculation refers to the data from the paper, adding up each of the sources they reported, and the VO2 lactate calculation refers to our new method. So that was 30 minutes at 85% VO2 max intensity. I was also curious to compare this approach to a Wingate test. A Wingate test is a 30 second all out sprint. As we saw earlier, people can deplete huge portions of their glycogen in just 30 seconds during these maximal efforts. So I extracted VO2 and lactate values from a published study, ran the numbers in a similar way and compared that with the changes in muscle glycogen. By the way, the code and calculations for all of this are shown as a supplemental file within the published paper. And so when we compare the two approaches for estimating carb use, the results are also spot on. Here we see data for males on the top rows and females on the bottom rows. Phew, I know that was a lot, so thank you for staying with me. Let's take a little breather and shift our attention to the practical side. In the daily training environment, athletes and coaches routinely capture measures of training load, which can be measured and classified as either internal and or external based on the measurable aspects occurring internally or externally to the athlete. So internal load reflects the relative strain and disturbance in homeostasis in response to an external load. The external load is characterized by objective measures like distance, power, or speed. Due to the popularity of cycling power meters, total work done during exercise is a common measure of external training load for cyclists as is training stress score, or TSS. In short, training load represents a single value to capture how long and how hard your session was. So the next logical question might be, can we connect our measured carb and calorie use with measures of training load to get an idea of how much carbohydrate or total calories we use during each session? This would also give us some idea as to whether accumulating the same training load through long, easy, or short, hard sessions cause the same amount of carbohydrate depletion. So we designed a study to address several of these key questions. We first had 15 cyclists each perform four lab-based training sessions. That allowed us to look at relationships between measures of training load and carbohydrate and calorie use. We could then model the relationships using training load along with some other measures like session duration or VO2 max. We then tested the models in a new set of cyclists, runners and kayakers performing a similar yet different training session. So let's first take a short look at the types of sessions we used. The first session was a graded exercise test so we could establish exercise thresholds and VO2 max. Then we have the four training sessions. So there were two easy sessions at 90% of power at the first ventilatory threshold. One was 30 minutes and one was 90 minutes. Then there were two interval sessions, one longer one, which included two sets of five by three minute best effort intervals, and a shorter one, which included two sets of 10 by 30 second on, 30 second off intervals. We also used the same 15 minute warm up across all four sessions, which allowed us to calculate the day-to-day -day variability in things like heart rate, efficiency, and RPE. In the bottom right, we see the session used for the validation portion of the study, which was 30 minutes easy, followed by six by three minute best effort intervals. So what did we find? This figure shows the six different training load measures, as well as the measured carbohydrate and calorie use, each separated by the four types of sessions. So each color is one of the different sessions. It's a lot to look at, so we'll focus in on just a few. 
The black lines indicate no significant difference between sessions for that given measure. If there's no black lines, that means the sessions are significantly different from each other. Let's first focus in on TSS. What this is showing is that TSS was the highest for the long interval session, whereas the long easy session and the short interval session led to the same TSS, and the short easy session had the lowest TSS. Looking at total carb use, we see the same pattern. Long intervals burn the most, long easy and short intervals burn the same, and short easy burn the least. Now it's not too surprising that the hard long session burned the most and the short easy one burned the least, but it is really interesting to see that the long easy and the short hard ones burned the same. And when we look at all of them, TSS is the only measure to accurately reflect that similarity. Total work done, which is commonly used, didn't even come close. Total work done was actually the same between the long easy and the long hard sessions, and much lower for the short hard session. So matching up carbohydrate intake with total work done could be slightly misleading. However, total work done and total energy expenditure do line up better than any other measures, so understanding your context and clarifying your question is critical. So this shows us the correlation values between each measure of training load and total energy use on the left and total carb use on the right. The higher the value, the more these measures are correlated, with one being a perfect correlation. The first number shown is the estimate, and the numbers in brackets are the 95% confidence intervals. The key takeaway is that all measures of training load are quite well correlated with both carb and calorie expenditure, but total work done and heart rate based TSS are the most highly correlated with total energy expenditure, and TSS, which is power based, has the best correlation with carb use. So the next step was to build models and then test them in a new group of athletes. The models for each measure of training load were slightly different, but typically included some measure of fitness like VO2 max or VT2, along with session duration and or sex or prior day training load. You can read more about the specifics in the paper. What I'll show you next are the results as predicted versus actual values for each participant and each measure of training load in the validation study. Each color here represents a different sport and each of the six blocks represents a different training load measure. Along the bottom of each graph is the model predicted carb use and along the side are the measured actual values. The diagonal lines represent perfect predictions, meaning they match up exactly with the measured values. What we see is the blue dots, or cycling, are generally lining up quite well, and there's a bit of an offset, albeit a consistent one, with the kayak and run data. This is most apparent in the bottom right corner for total work done. The points are off, but in a consistent manner, likely due to differences inherent to the mode of exercise, differences in the measurement of work, or both. These are the results for total energy expenditure, and we see a fairly similar story, where cycle data is the closest, and there are consistent offsets for kayak and run, particularly around total work done in the bottom right corner. The cool thing about that is we can do what's called a calibration adjustment. What that means is we fit a model that corrects the fitted line, and we get something like this, where the blue dots are now the unadjusted values and the pink dots are the adjusted one. So looking again at that bottom right corner, we can take those blue ones and tilt the line so that things are calibrated properly for each sport. So each sport and each training load metric has its own calibration adjustment, and we can more confidently apply these models across cycling, running, and kayaking. So finally, how can we actually use this with athletes? It will vary slightly depending on which measure of training load you prefer, but we can look at an example using TSS. If the TSS is 82 for a 75 minute session, and the athlete's VO2 at VT2, which is a measure that is fairly easily obtainable from any lab testing, but could also be estimated from FTP power, is 3.2. So the bottom line of numbers is something that looks complicated, but is simple math based on numbers provided in the paper. So in this context, we get an estimated value of 1,013 calories for this session. Now, depending on the sport, we can make the appropriate calibration adjustment. Again, these numbers are all included in the paper, see tables two and three. And so we can get an estimated calorie expenditure that is adjusted based on the exercise mode. If it was a run session with those same values for TSS and, and duration, it would be about 860 calories, and for kayak, it would be about 850. I know that was a lot, so we'll wrap things up here. To summarize some of the key points, all measures of training load correlate well with carbohydrate and energy expenditure during exercise. So TSS may be the best at matching carbohydrate, total work done is the best for energy expenditure, but any one can really be used effectively. When combined with other measures of fitness, energy expenditure and carb use during exercise can be estimated accurately. And these models can be applied in running and kayaking when used with a calibration adjustment. So thank you again for your time. Feel free to reach out with any questions, and I'd love to know what you think and or if you're applying this.